Thank you very much for having me. I'm uh, Dr. Michel Akkad. I'm a cardiologist. I'm the medical director of uh, Athletic Heart of San Francisco. It's a kind of a gimmick name. It's, it's, it's a cardiology clinic, but I, I wanted to make it appealing. So I, I treat athletes, but I treat you know everybody who has questions or concerns about the heart. So I'm going to talk about uh, you know the heart of a cyclist and the insights from sports cardiology. Uh, the cardiology community has paid attention to um, issues related to the heart and exercise and sports, the you know good and bad. So I'd like to give you a little bit the outline of my my talk here. Uh, warning: not a, not a lecture about how to boost your performance. Uh, sometimes I get people come and say, "Hey, doc, you know what about this protein shake?" And I, I, I don't know. <laughs> you know. I'm here to make sure that you you can do your you know enjoy your sport uh, safely, your exercise safely. So I will have a few preliminary comments. Uh, and then I will talk about uh, the uh, cardiac adaptations, how the heart adapts to regular high intensity cycling and endurance exercise. Uh, and then I'll cover the question of screening uh, cyclists for occult heart disease. That's something that's always in the news, been in the news for, for a number of years. It's, uh, it's controversial, so I'll cover the controversies and I'll offer perhaps what might be a reasonable solution. And then finally, trouble in paradise, uh, you know, are there long-term ill effects of high-intensity cycling? And that's also has been, it's been in the news uh, for a number of years now, and you keep hearing. And I'll share with you some, some recent uh, uh, data um, regarding that. Okay. All right, the preliminary remarks. So the first, uh, I want to situate a little bit cycling as far as the heart is concerned compared to other forms of, uh, of exercise. Uh, this is a table constructed by the American Heart Association a few years ago because for, for the purpose of doing research in cardiology and sports, in sports cardiology, it's important to try to classify different sports because, uh, you know, we, we, we have this uh, intuitive sense and then there's also uh, physiological reasons why different sports may not affect the heart in the same way. So the American Heart Association uh, came up with this um, this classification where it's a, uh, it's a, you know, a three by three table where on one axis, uh, it has to do with increasing dynamic component of, of the sport, where the sport, you know, at the, the, the last column is performed at a high percentage of the VO2 max, so a lot of dynamic uh, component. And on that scale, on the uh, vertical scale is uh, increasing static components, so, so uh, you know, weight or pushing or pulling, you know, things that are static. And, and then they populated the different sports uh, according to the, those two dimensions here. Now, that's been a source of endless controversy. Nobody is happy about where they stand. They all complain, uh, especially the, the people in the box, in the green box at the corner there. You know, and so you, where you have, I don't know if you can see it, but you have golf, riflery, billiards, and curling. And the curling people are like, what, are you kidding me? You're putting me next to golf, that's uh, unacceptable, you know, we don't want that. And, and so, so they, but for cyclists, and, and some of you, you know, if, if you have, uh, obviously I think you, many of you have an interest in cycling, you can rest assured, you can rest, uh, uh, you know, comforted that you're at the very top corner there with the most dynamic exercise and the most static exercise. So cyclist, cycling is up there along with boxing and canoeing and rowing and, and triathlon. Um, another reason this uh, table has been controversial or a source of, uh, of headaches, although it's, it, it has to be done, I mean, if you're going to do research, you sort of, uh, at some level, have to you have to classify things, is that um, for a topic that I won't cover, it's return to sport after a cardiac event. So when, when athletes have a cardiac event and then they, we, we, you know, we treat them and whatnot, when can they return to sport? There are some conditions where uh, you know, some authorities will say, well, you can only do sport in the green box. And so people say, what? In the green box? I'm condemned to playing golf the rest of my life. That's unacceptable. And, and it may be too extreme because uh, the recommendation is invariably very, very conservative coming from the cardiology community. It's always go back to the green box or go to the green box. And it's changing now where, you know, cardiologists are, are trying to say, well, listen, well, how about we, we tell you what the risks are and then we can, you know, come up with a... a a reasonable um, 
uh, you know, a reasonable plan for, for what you might do after your, your cardiac injury. And then, of course, also the, the other thing about this, this classification is that, you know, if you say cycling and you put cycling at the, the top, you know, uh, right-hand corner there, uh, you say, okay, yes, um, but there may be different cycles. I mean, you know, in the hills here, you may use a lot of static motion and whatnot. If you live in the Midwest, and you do, or maybe if you do, uh, you know, indoor cycling and things like that, it might be more of a, um, you know, uh, high high dynamic but lesser static components. And then people have different styles in which they exercise and so forth. So it's, you know, it, it's not a guarantee that what what you do will necessarily fit you in into one of these um, these boxes. Okay, so cycling versus other endurance sports, we cannot really make clear distinctions between cycling and other endurance sports, uh, really. There are variabilities between the types of cycling and, and types of you know, other sports, individual variabilities in exercise form, and, and then variabilities in, in testing conditions, because if you want to test the effect of certain you know, sports, we actually, when we do our cardiac, cardiac testing, it's pretty, um, uh, restricted. So we test the, 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 you know, people who do, I don't know, uh, uh, orienteering or, or cross-country skiing. We don't, we don't test them on a cross-country thing. We test them usually on a treadmill or on a cardiac, uh, you know, on a, on a stationary bike and so forth. So, so, so it's hard to make distinctions. And in general, uh, all I want to say here with these preliminary remarks is that uh, the cardiac adaptations for cyclists, the heart, the way the heart adapts, we lump it with the rest of the endurance sports, you know, running and, and triathlons or cross-country skiing or rowing and so forth. And the other thing is that the complications that we've seen, the cardiac complications among cyclists tend to be similar uh, to those of other endurance athletes. So, so I'm going to talk about, you know, cyclists and, and, and the heart of the cyclists today, and I'll try as much as possible to skew it towards, um, you know, the bicycle. Um, but you know, it's it's really shared. You know, the 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 the, um, uh, the adaptation and the concerns about the heart are shared between you know uh, cycling and other uh, endurance type sports. All right, and another remark that I want to say um, uh, to, or talk about here is that, you know the nature of uh, physiological distinctions. When we say well, cyclists tend to have a heart that's, you know, larger or have, you know, on, on the EKG, they have this and they have that. Well, really, uh, all the physiologic distinctions fall on a bell-shaped curve, okay? And the population of cyclists as a population may be shifted one way, depending if we're talking about the voltage on the EKG or if we're talking about the cardiac dimension or if we're talking about the pulse rate, the population as a whole will be shifted but there's always a lot of overlap between, you know, the normal population and the population of athletes. So that it's not because you're a, you know, high-performing and you know cyclist that you necessarily will have a heart that is bigger than normal. Okay, so if you get tested, don't be disappointed to say, oh, what my my heart is only within normal limits. You know, that's a bummer. No, no, it's just, you know, uh, there's there's a uh, quite a, um, um, a large amount of uh, overlap, a lot of overlap with with normal, and there's also a lot of overlap with abnormal, which I will talk about at some point uh, later in the lecture. Okay, so cardiac adaptations, the cyclist's heart. What is it that we can expect? Um, the number one thing that we can expect that's most common that distinguishes the endurance athletes from the more sedentary uh, person. Um, oh, before I, I'll break those down. Sorry, I'll break those uh, topics into electrical, what we see on the electrocardiogram, structural, you know, the size of the chambers of the heart and so forth, or functional, how the heart performs in general. And then I will talk a little bit about the effect of. Uh, sex, age, size, and ethnicity on, on these uh, adaptations of, of the heart. Okay, so the number one kind of adaptation is what we called sinus bradycardia, which is really the slow resting pulse. And I think most of you are familiar with the slow resting pulse. The slow re resting pulse is really, uh, you know, it gives you bragging rights. You know, you say, hey, my pulse is 52 or my pulse is 48. You know, as you compare your resting pulse 
uh, you know, athletes love to do that. But sometimes they get nervous when they come to the doctor. And then I see them and their pulse rate is 70 because they're a little nervous and they say, doctor, doctor, I, I swear at home my pulse is fine. I'll show you my, <laughs> my track, uh, my, my Garmin, my pulse rate is really, okay, relax, relax, I understand. It doesn't mean that it's a, it's a problem if, you're, if your uh, resting pulse is not slow. But, but it's very common. It's common among well-trained athletes. About 80% of well-trained athletes have a, what we call the resting bradycardia, which is arbitrarily defined as a heart rate, a resting pulse rate below 50, 60 or below 58. And it can be profound. Some athletes have a pulse you know, in the 40s, some of them even in the 30s. And then it can be accompanied by what we call heart block. And I will show you examples of that in the next few slides, where even there are some beats that are skipped. Okay? It's, not only is the heart rate very slow, but, but there are skipped beats. Uh, for the longest time, uh, at least I thought uh, that this was attributed to actually not something to do with the heart, but something to do with the brain and the autonomic nervous system. And that because the, the, the brain sends impulse to the heart, the heart beats auton autonomously. The heart doesn't need the brain to beat. It will beat by itself. If you take cardiac cells and you put them in a Petri dish, they will beat you know, on their own. So the brain beats autonomously, but the, the speed of, of um, the heartbeat and the, and the strength of the contraction is modulated by impulses from the, the autonomic nervous system. And the autonomic nervous system has two branches, the sympathetic, which is activated when you're you know, doing things and, and active and engaged in exercise or when you're frightened and so forth, and the so-called parasympathetic nervous system, which is dominates when you're very relaxed or when you're sleeping or sometimes paradoxically even when you're frightened you know the the uh, the, the the parasympathetic nervous system will be active and the nerve from the parasympathetic nervous system that feeds the heart is the vagal nerve so so for the longest time it was thought that the athletes have a slow pulse rate because there's activation of the vagal tone and it turns out that it's controversial. Uh, now people think that no, it may have something to do with actually the structure of the, uh, the, um, the heart itself. Uh, so the cause is unclear, but sinus bradycardia is very, very common. And on an EKG, this is what it looks like. It's a slow pulse um, and typically no symptoms, right? Uh, the, the, it, and it's benign and it goes away with exercise. So if there's any question whether the heart rate is too slow, it's abnormal or not, you do a few jumping jacks, and then if the heart rate goes up, then you're okay. All right, so no symptoms and goes away with exercise, probably, probably benign. Then um, you can have sinus bradycardia with AV block when you skip beats. Uh, I don't know if you, you know, if you look, focus maybe on the last uh, row there where you have like three heartbeats in a row and then boom, there's a drop in the, in the heartbeat uh, there, and then it, it, it resumes. Again, that can be completely benign uh, if, it's, if uh, the person doesn't have any symptoms. And it happens frequently during sleep, because during sleep there's actually involvement of the vagus nerve and, and, and so forth. And, and it goes away with exercise. Okay, asymptomatic, goes away with exercise, sort of benign. Um, other things that, are, that uh, athletes uh, demonstrate is that variations in, in the heartbeat with respirations. Okay? You may not notice it, but actually if you run a, a rhythm strip, if you, if you, you, you can see just with breathing, with inspiration and expiration, the heartbeat beat will be a little faster and a little slower. That's actually, that's very common in, in kids and in adolescents. You see that even though those who are not athletic, but athletes tend to maintain that. So they, they stay youthful, you know, longer and they maintain, maintain what we call respiratory sinus arrhythmia. This is just, it's called an, it's called arrhythmia, but that's a bit of a misnomer because it's not really abnormal. It, it's, it's normal. It's a pronounced change in pulse rate in response to respirations. And sometimes athletes, when, you know, they, they may not, uh, they were not in the habit of feeling their pulse and then they get into the habit of feeling their pulse and then they notice this irregularity and they think this is something wrong, but no, it's, it's not, it's actually perfectly normal and a, generally a sign of good health. Um, which we also, that same 
variability in the heart rate is now picked up. There are lots of devices where you can monitor your heart rate variability, your beat-to-beat -beat variability. And it's generally thought to be a sign of good, good health and good conditioning to have a lot of heart rate variability you know, from, from beat to beat. So these are the, um, some of the electrical adaptation related to the, to the heart rhythm. There are other uh, electrical adaptations uh, of the heart that we observe on EKG that have to do with the change in the configuration of the, of the ECG, of you know, that squiggly line. I don't really want to get into uh, too much of the technical details. Um, uh, many of them, um, some of them reflect uh, changes in the cardiac structure, because as the heart enlarges, which I will talk about in a moment, as the heart enlarges in response to ex exercise, the EKG itself, the voltage on the EKG, you know, may, may get bigger and so forth. But there are other changes that, that uh, we see uh, on the EKG, what we call an incomplete right bundle branch block is common in, in athletes, Re repolarization changes, J-point elevation, tall T waves, or inverted T waves, and so forth. Um, it, it's, it's primarily of use to the cardiologist or to the person interpreting the EKG so that we don't misinterpret an EKG that is a normal adaptation to, uh, to long-term exercise, misinterpret it as something abnormal. So, so the, 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 the doctor, the cardiologist, has to be aware of, of these changes among athletes. And, um, and that's uh, all I'll mention here about the electrical changes. There are structural changes that I think you're probably aware of in that, again, as a group, the athletes, the well-trained athletes, especially the endurance athletes, will have bigger hearts. And all four chambers of the heart you know, can enlarge or can seem larger than normal. The left ventricle, the right ventricle, the left atrium, and the right atrium can all demonstrate increased cavity sizes. The most prominent increase in size would be from the left ventricle, but all of them, uh, all, all four chambers can increase. And generally with the increase in the cavity size, there's also an increase in the thickness of the heart muscle itself, uh, particularly of the left ventricle. That's really the, 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 the thickest uh, part of the heart that's what we can really measure. And, and so there's an increase in the left ventricular wall thickness that we observe, that's the sort of cardiac adaptation. And now you remember that um, table, that three by three table, and I showed you that the cyclist, there's actually, uh, it, it's not completely random. Back in the 1990s, uh, some uh, cardiologist in Spain did a study where they, or I think, no, no, it was Italy, uh, Spirito, yes, it's, it's the team in Italy. Uh, Italy has been at the forefront of, of sports cardiology. They, they were, for a long time, they were the leaders in, uh, in their interest in sports cardiology, doing research on, on adaptation and maladaptation. They tried to compare all kinds of sports. So they, they tested a whole bunch of athletes. And, and then they ranked, you know, as a population, the, the, the percent uh, increase in the size of the heart in any given sport compared to a typical sedentary heart. And so they ranked all the different sports. And cycling is at the top uh, in terms of dimension of the heart. And it's also at the top, or second to, second to, to, to first, you know, it's second place as far as thickness of the heart muscle. And, and typically, we associate increase of size with dynamic uh, effort, whereas increase in thickness will be more you know, the, the static efforts, the, the, there'll be a component of that. At any rate, uh, it's just cyclists have really, the cyclist heart is the, is the biggest um, in this study. Um, all right, and then there are cardiac adaptations that are functional, meaning that we don't, uh, we may not see any difference compared to the normal population on the electrocardiogram. We may not see any difference when we look at the ultrasound of the heart in terms of the heart size or the thickness. But clearly, you know, the, the person is super competitive and doing very well. And it's because there are functional adaptations of the heart. The heart is able to relax very efficiently. There's a very uh, efficient stroke volume, the volume of blood ejected, eject, ejected during every, each heartbeat, and the uh, ability of the heart and the cardiovascular system in general to 
um, uh, to uh, assimilate oxygen, to extract oxygen and, and uh, consume it is very, very high, so it's peak performance. So there are functional adaptations that, that we may not see just looking at the EKG or looking at, at static pictures of the heart, okay, that we only detect from, from the performance of, uh, of the athlete. All right. And then um, in terms of differences between uh, men and women, there's less data regarding female than male athletes, in part because uh, the increase in sports participation among females is relatively recent, you know, it's about maybe 20 years or so, whereas uh, before that it was primarily male uh, athletes that were being studied. That's changing now, there's more data. And compared to male athletes in general, female athletes exhibit less, less absolute increases in cardiac size and wall thickness uh, compared to male athletes. But that's in large part has to do with just the general size of, of female athletes, which tends to be smaller than male athletes, because size is a big determinant of uh, the, you know, the size, the body surface area is a big determinant of the, the size of the heart to begin with. So, so there's, there's less absolute increases in the cardiac size and in the wall thickness in female athletes. And female athletes exhibit less overlap with what I will talk about in a minute, which is the pathologic cardiac dimensions. Male athletes, you can see some male athletes that have hearts that are so abnormally large that you think for sure there's gonna be a, you know, a pathology here, when in fact their hearts are completely normal, but they're, they're, they're so big that they overlap with what, you know, they're way beyond what we consider the range of normal for, for normal people. And, uh, and in female athletes, it's less the case. So the, all it means that if we are examining a female athlete and we see a heart that is really quite large, we should be a little cautious to attribute it to, to, uh, to the sport itself and, and, and start thinking, well, is this pathological, you know, um, because there, there's generally less overlap with the pathologic cardiac dimensions. And then the risk of sudden death uh, during exercise is much less for, for uh, female athletes than it is for men, by, generally by a rate of 10 to 1. Um, and I'm, I'll talk about that a little bit later. All right. Um, ethnicity uh, seems to be important. This is, uh, um, it's been known for a while, but in the last few years, there's been a lot of data out of England. Uh, particularly, there's a big uh, sports cardiology center in London that, uh, that studies athletes and has made the distinction. And uh, black athletes, whether they're African-American or Afro-Caribbean in, you know, in, in, uh, in England, uh, have more pronounced uh, changes on the ECG, more pronounced ECG changes, the repolarization abnormalities are more pronounced, T wave changes. Even though the heart is, you know, once they are studied, the heart is actually normal. They, they don't seem to have any pathology, but the, the changes on the EKG is, is much more dramatic, or can be, can be more dramatic uh, among uh, black athletes. Uh, there's a propensity for a greater increase in wall thickness. Um, there's no appreciable um, difference in cavity size but there, of the left ventricle, but there's a larger average cavity size of the right ventricle compared to white athletes. So these are little tidbits of, of information, again, for the, uh, the, the, the doctor who's interpreting the data to be aware of. And, and because of that, um, it's been proposed that we should have some screening uh, uh, criteria for interpretation of screening EKGs a little bit different when, when we're screening uh, black athletes compared to, uh, to other athletes. Now, we don't know so much about different ethnicities besides you know, compared, comparing to you know, Asian and so forth. There's not enough data. But so far, um, that's, it, it, it seems clear that black athletes tend to have uh, uh, more pronounced changes on the EKG. And if we're going to use the EKG as a screening test, we need to be aware of that. Which brings me to the second part of the talk here. Should cyclists or athletes in general be screened for occult heart disease, and that's a topic of endless controversy. I'll give you my, my perspective in a little bit, but the screening rationale is, is the following. Uh, on the pro side to screen is that sudden cardiac arrest is frequently fatal, right? It, it's, uh, uh, it, it's, um, the statistics are, are, are pretty grim for out-of-hospital cardiac arrest, you know, being able to, to survive that. And so it's uh, frequently fatal with a high cost, obviously, to victims, to the families, and to communities as well. It can be pretty traumatic. And then most conditions, although not all of them, but most conditions leading to cardiac arrest are potentially detectable 
by screening. So that's the the rationale why you know uh, people think or some people you know advocate for screening. On the flip side, the absolute numbers are extremely small. You know, they make headlines when you have a, a famous athlete that drops dead. They make headlines and it's kind of shocking and it. But the absolute numbers are, are, are really quite small, number one. Number two, the screening tests are not perfect, okay? Uh, and because they're not perfect, they're not perfect in, in as screening tests because you want a screening test that is fairly fast where you can screen a whole bunch of people rapidly that is not expensive, that doesn't have too much false positive and false negatives, and screening test and the main screening test that we're talking about, which would be the EKG, really doesn't fulfill uh, those criteria. Um, and so, so, so it's, it's not a great uh, tool uh, for, we don't have great tools to screen a whole bunch of people. And then if we can't screen a bunch of people, but we're still gonna have screening policies, then it becomes ethically a little problematic, sp especially for example, for schools, for colleges. If schools, if a school is going to say, "Well, we want to screen, but we're only going to screen our athletes," um, okay, fine. But the problem is, uh, why not screen the other kids? Because cardiac arrest can also happen in, you know, it doesn't happen only in athletes. You know, so the cardiac pathologies happens to everybody, and athletes. It may be more frequent because engaging in intense exercise can be a provoc provocative factor in the su sudden cardiac arrest. But it doesn't have to be. And people drop dead from occult cardiac disease who are not athletes. And so it becomes a little bit ethically problematic. So, so, so this is why it's, it's difficult to, to get to a consensus uh, regarding the screening rationale. But I want to give you here just a, you know, a list. I'm not going to go into the details. There are many, many different kinds of heart conditions and heart diseases that can lead to cardiac arrest. And that makes the screening particularly challenging because since you have different conditions. You know, one uh, that is talked about is hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, where you have an abnormal thickening of the heart muscle because of a genetic defect in the, in the proteins the, of, of the, the heart muscle. Uh, you can have this hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, and people may not have any symptoms until the moment that they drop dead. Uh, other forms of cardiomyopathies, uh, the same. Electrical disorders, disorders with the uh, um, the uh, proteins in the heart that conduct the chemical electrical signal uh, can, can be abnormal and lead to cardiac arrest. There can be abnormalities in the coronary arteries uh, that are anomalous at birth. And again, uh, all these things may not manifest themselves until there's a sudden cardiac arrest event, which could be provoked by exercise, by intense exercise. So these are the congenital uh, conditions and on the the other column we have the acquired condition that are more important for uh, as we get older uh, the number one uh, condition would be coronary atherosclerosis right coronary artery disease plaque build up in the coronary arteries which is a, a, an increasingly important factors as we both continue to exercise in middle age and beyond which is great but on the other hand there seems to be uh, more exposure to, to problems of, of coronary atherosclerosis, and I'll touch on this a little bit later in the, in the, the talk. There are also acquired cardiomyopathies, and then the effects of uh, high blood pressure can have on the heart can, can potentially lead to, uh, to significant, significant cardiac complications, okay? So as I mentioned, there are technical issues in differentiating the athlete's heart from the abnormal heart, um, because there's, uh, there's overlap um, you know, the, the athletic heart, these are male athletes and female athletes, and on the, the x-axis is the, the heart dimension. If you look at the male athletes, this is what I was talking about earlier. Many male athletes have hearts that are way beyond what is normally considered the upper limits of normal for, for the size of the heart, which is usually 60 millimeters for the cardiac dimension, the size of the left ventricle. You have up to 14 patients, 14% 14 of athletes that have a heart bigger than that. And, uh, and, you know, 48% that have uh, a heart that is clearly, uh, you know, above 55 millimeters. 55 millimeters is actually technically considered upper limits of normal. 60 is a stretch. But so, so you see that there's a lot of overlap and it makes screening difficult. So there are technical issues differentiating the athletic heart from the abnormal heart if you rely on just one, one screening test. And then there are clinical issues 
clinical issues. Not all abnormal hearts will kill you. Do you recognize this? Uh, who's, who's this? Let's, let's the die hard. Eddie Merckx. Eddie Merckx, the cannibal, born in 1945. So Eddie Merckx had, uh, in 1968, or even before, when he was participating in the European, the Tour de France and the European races, had been checked out. And this is what the cardiologist back then in 1968 remarked. He said, Mark's cardiogram was alarming. And at first, Lavizzaro, his cardiologist, thought it was from someone who had suffered a heart attack. It turned out Eddie Merckx has a hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. We know that be beyond any doubt. And not only that, on my, that's him, his, his, a quote from him. On my father's side, there are many heart problems. My dad and several uncles died young. So there's no doubt that if Eddie Merckx had been screened today, he would have been disqualified from participating in cycling exercises because he has an abnormal heart. And clinically speaking, it's a very high risk situation, high family history of sudden death, a thick heart with an abnormal EKG and whatnot. But all we can say is, you know, we're talking about risks and probabilities, okay? And, and here we have Eddie Merckx, who, you know, turned out to be the, 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 one of the, the most amazing uh, cyclists uh, in history, who so far is uh, still ticking, right? <laughs> he is still ticking. On the other hand, unfortunately, sudden cardiac death does happen, right? It happens, and if you, if you follow the, you know, the news and whatnot, the cycling news, you will have prominent uh, cyclists who, who drop dead, and, and that's unfortunate. You know, uh, it's it's frequent enough that we'd like to do something about it, but it's also rare. It's also rare. This is a study of the incidence of sudden cardiac death in professional cycling. Okay. Now, in terms of getting the real numbers of how many people die, it, it's extremely difficult because what is the? Uh, how do you catch all these people? Right? Do you go by media report? Do you only look at professional cyclists? Do you only pe look at people who die during events? You know, like the, you know, these. It, it's really it's, it's very hard to get you know uh, clear cut numbers. But if you do a study, and here they studied only death during events, during professional cycling events, Tour de France and and uh, and, and big professional cycling events, sudden cardiac death appears to be a very rare phenomenon in professional cycling with a lower incidence compared to other sports. Again, the cyclist can be uh, um, uh, feel comforted here, but I think I would take that with a, grain, you know, with a grain of salt. A lower incidence compared with other sports and athletic cohorts. You know, six out of 98 documented deaths in these professional events in the last decades, you know, since they could go back, have been cardiac. So there's a very, very tiny, tiny number. On the other hand, but, so it's rare, but, Non-race sudden cardiac death is frequently not counted, right? And non-professional sudden cardiac death rarely attracts media attention, so it's hard to really get the proper numerator. And pr plus, professional cyclists are thoroughly screened in general. So if you only look at professional cyclists, you know, the, the problem people are probably weeded out already. But it's clear that it's not, it's not huge numbers. It's not like epidemics of coronary disease or, 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 and so forth and whatnot. But the other thing is th there's no, you know, what is an acceptable risk or what is a low enough? It's kind of a personal judgment. You cannot say, well, over this number, we need to do something. And below that number, we can, we can you, you know, it, it, there's, no, uh, there's no rationally um, uh, rational number that we can use to say this is enough or high enough that we need to do something about it. Um, you know, there's no threshold uh, of uh, sudden cardiac death inc incidents that we we can say. But nevertheless, I mean, I think it's clear that it's it's not very common. Uh, but it's a problem, you know, if, especially if you're interested in cycling. So my personal approach to to get out of this quagmire is that. I agree that screening is problematic, that it's, it's very difficult to envision mass screening of all kids or all college athletes um, on a systematic basis and whatnot, because screening is a mass event. And I distinguish screening from evaluation, where evaluation might be an individual attention. 
where it's no longer a public health approach, but it's more of a clinical health approach. And the distinction is, but I mean, if people want to be, if people are interested, are concerned, or have have a concern, then I think there is value in in doing an evaluation, because when you do the evalu evaluation individually to one person, you can involve multiple tests from the get-go. You don't have to rely on just one screening test to make your decision. You can involve multiple, multiple tests from the get-go. You don't have any ethical issues because you, you know, it's open to everyone. Anybody who's, who, who's interested in doing this you know, should be able to get it. And I think there's value in, in doing this as opposed to thinking about screening where you always wonder, you know, have I missed, have I used the proper test, or have we missed people, or are we excluding people from screening that we shouldn't be excluding, and so forth. So in screening, the focus is on decreasing rates, and the rates to begin with are, are, are pretty low. So to try to decrease the rates even lower seems to be you know, you know, hard to achieve. Whereas in an evaluation, you're focused on the individual. And so you can assess, well, what is, what is the concern of the individual? What are the needs? What is the risk tolerance of that person? And so forth. So, so it makes more sense to think of it clinically rather than to, to think about it from a public health approach. OK, so that's, uh, it's not a solution for the public health approach, but it's just how I, I view things in my own practice. OK? Finally, I'm going to talk the rest. The third part of the, the talk will be trouble in paradise. What about the long-term effects of, um, of, um, uh, of exercise on the heart? Is too much exercise bad for you? I suspect you've, you've seen those headlines or read those ma magazine articles. Every, every, uh, every year, there are some magazine articles. Our elite cyclists are at greater risks for heart problems. I'm going to give you the good, the bad, and the ugly. And the good is that if you look at the French participants in the Tour de France as a cohort, they do great. They live a long and happy life, OK? So as a cohort, the French participants in the Tour de France do very well. Compared to the general, general population, we observed a 41% lower mortality in French cyclists compared to the general population, which is, I think, it's a good sign. You know, that it's, you know, it, it can be that being a high-performing athlete is that bad for you. But bear in mind, this is comparing to the general French population, meaning among those people are a lot of people who sm smoke unfiltered cigarettes and spend three hours at the cafe talking about existentialism and whatnot. And, you know, so so, so it's, not, it's not comparing to other you know, healthy people who may not engage in super high-performance activities. But in general, I think this is a good... Um, it's a good, uh, good news, and in the same uh, paper here, the same report that came out a couple of years ago, they show that there's decreased rates of everything, decreased rates of cancer, decreased rates of heart disease, decreased rates of nervous system disease, so everything seems to be improved in the cohort of the Tour de France participants that they followed for decades. Okay? So that's the good news. The bad news is that there's one condition that in the last, I say, 10, 15 years has been proven, I think, beyond any doubt to occur more frequently in endurance athletes compared to the general population, including the general healthy population, and that's atrial fibrillation, which is this nagging irregularity of the heart rhythm, uh, where the heart rhythm becomes erratic, sometimes fast, and Many, most people are, have symptoms from that. They will either have palpitations or they will see that they're not able to perform as well as they, as they wished. And so atrial fibrillation undoubtedly uh, occurs more frequently in a, I would say, a subset. And it's usually between um, 5 to 10% uh, of athletes. And it doesn't matter what, what sports you look at, whether it's cyclists, this is a series of cyclists, uh, professional cyclists, whether you look at cross-country skiers, whether you look at um, you know runners or whatnot, or th there's an, and it's predominantly in men. Women seem not to be affected, so predominantly men. About five to ten percent will develop atrial fibrillation, um, usually in middle age and beyond, and and it will typically lead to. Um, you know, it will impact the ability to pursue high-level endurance activities, and it interferes with the quality of life. So it's more than five times more common of, among veteran endurance athletes than in the general and healthy but less active population. And the rate is five to eight percent. In some series, it's ten percent, but it's in that in that in that range. 
And the problem is we, we can't predict, except that knowing that males are more, more, um, uh, more susceptible, there are also a few other factors. We know that having a lower resting heart rate seems to, to be associated with the risk of atrial fibrillation, being tall, uh, having a large left atrium on the echocardiogram, all these seems to be, seem to be associated with a high risk of developing atrial fibrillation. But really, they're, they're not distinct enough. First of all, they're not something that you can do anything about typically, right? You cannot uh, shrink your size if you wanted to, if you, if you happen to be tall. Um, but they're not, they're, they're not distinguishing enough to be able to say, look, listen, you're headed for atrial fibrillation. You need, we need to, you need to slow down, or you need to do something different. So we don't know. There may also be other factors. You know, could, could there be, could there be inflammatory factors? Possibly. Uh, could there be scarring of the atrium? Possibly. Does the use of stimulants? We don't know. That's get tossed about. I don't think that's 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 a factor. But um, the problem is, it's difficult to predict and anticipate. The good news is that atrial fibrillation in athletes seems to respond well to standard treatments for atrial fibrillation, including ablation. There have been series now of athletes being treated with ablation therapy for atrial fibrillation, and they seem to be responding quite well. So that's, that's on, the, on the good news. OK, the ugly. That's the most recent data that I wanted to share with you. And uh, I'm going to wrap things up, because I think we're, we're getting to the end here. Um, there seems to be a propensity for male athletes in middle age and beyond to develop more coronary calcifications, more plaque buildup in the coronary arteries compared to healthy but less active age-matched men, okay? That had been talked about for a number of years and for a long time we were very skeptical because the studies were small, they were not well controlled and whatnot. But last summer there was a, a fairly large study comparing 150 master's level veteran athletes to healthy, equally healthy, but a little bit less active uh, controls, and the athletes had a lot more coronary calcification and coronary plaque. That's number one bad thing. And that's the coronary calcification. You can see it on a CT scan. It can be done by, with a fairly uh, um, uh, cheap and non-invasive CT scan, the, the coronary calcium scan. And, and that is an indicator that there's plaque buildup and narrowing of arteries. And What's even more uh, concerning is that in that, that same cohort, they did MRIs of athletes, and they found that there was, some of them had scar tissue in the heart, as opposed to the control. There was, the rate was 14% of scar tissue in uh, middle-aged veteran athletes compared to 0% in the controls. So, so quite a, an impressive difference. What does that mean? We don't know. We don't know if this, leads necessarily to poor outcomes in the future, you know, if we are able to detect that. This is too early to, t to tell. So, so I think the, the um, um, but it's, it's a point of concern. So the ugly is that middle-aged, master's level male endurance athletes have more coronary calcifications, more plaques, more bulky plaques than healthy, more sedentary controls. And there's more, they have more evidence of scar in the heart muscle that may ind indicate prior silent heart attacks, and, and the numbers were 14% versus 0%. And not only that, but there was, an, in another study, there was a positive relationship between the lifelong volume of, of exercise to really try to, to, to confirm that it seems to have something to do with the, the volume and intensity of, of exercise over the years, that, that this is a little bit like the, the drug, if you will, the, the dose response of, of exercise. Uh, there's a positive relationship between the lifelong volume of exercise and the amount of coronary calcium in middle-aged men. So this is the, the ugly right now that we don't know exactly what to do with that information. We don't know if it necessarily translates into, into poor outcomes. So there's conflicting data. So if we put the three, the good, the bad, and the ugly together, we say that there's no firm conclusion can be drawn regarding the overall impact of lifelong high-intensity endurance training, except for a high risk of atrial fibrillation. And then a subset of men seem to be prone to coronary calcifications, plaques, and, and heart scars, significance uncertain. And that subset may or may not be identified through periodic testing. Right now, I think most sports cardiologists tend to be a little more cautious and maybe recommend middle-aged men to undergo some kind of stress testing periodically, even though we're not really quite sure whether that makes any difference or not uh, long-term. 
but that's that's for for the 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 effects of uh, the potential bad effect of long term endurance exercise on the on the heart. Okay, so conclusion: long term endurance exercises leads to specific cardiac adaptations, which we term the athlete's heart. The features of the athlete's heart overlap with those of the abnormal heart, and screening is tricky and best left as a personal decision. That's about my my uh, my advice, my position, and it's most beneficial if paired with a commitment to healthy living, which would, we should never forget, you know, when we get wrapped up about screening and whatnot, and, and exercise particularly. So because exercise will not substitute for, you know, bad eating habits or bad other lifestyle habits. That's very important. And then there are a few clouds on the horizon, but generally bright skies for the amateur and professional cyclists. And the few clouds is what I was just mentioning regarding the cornea calcifications and the, the scars. Okay. Thank you very much. I, I'm sorry. I, I hope you have a little bit of time, perhaps, for questions. Uh, let me ask. Yes, in the back. Um, um, the, the late. Yes. Point you classify endurance cycling and then recreational cycling. And do you have a recommendation on what's optimized for for longevity or anything? Like that? No, no. There, there's no. There's no line, it's a continuum, and where do you draw the line? There are some amateur cyclists that do very high intensity. They're not professional, but they, they do very high intensity uh, sports. Uh, I don't know that you can draw the line. And all I can say is that the Tour de France guys seem to do okay, right? So, so it's hard to argue with that, but it's also hard to argue with the data that I just showed. It, it, it's Right now, it's, it's a real question mark, right? A real conundrum. I'm sorry, I'm going to repeat the question. The question is whether we can distinguish amateur cyclists versus, uh, uh, you know, professional, more professional. Do you have an optimized recommendation for just normal uh, I, 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 No, I don't. At this point, I don't. It, it would be based on just my opinion without any evidence to, to, to back it up. What we know is that as far as health is concerned, if you're, we're only talking about health and longevity, there's little extra bang for the buck from being a super intense athlete, right? You get most of your bang uh, for, for your buck just from being moderately active on a daily basis and eating healthy and, and, and not smoking and, and doing those sorts of things. Uh, so, but most, most people who engage in, in uh, athletic activities don't really do it for the health necessarily. They do it because they just enjoy it so much, right? So then the question is, at what point do you interfere with their enjoyment of, of, of uh, this activity on the basis of, you know, question mark and, and potential problems down the line? It's a tricky question, and I don't, I don't have an answer for, for that. Yes, one, one more question. Um, yes. If the data doesn't seem to ever involve women, is it because they really don't have a problem, or is it just because they never test women? So both, they, 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 they're testing women now, but, but women in general tend, have, tend to have fewer problems uh, across the board. So fewer, uh, much fewer sudden deaths. They do happen, but it's, it's, it's much rarer. Uh, but the data is coming. I, I think there's, there's a lag um, in the data, so. You. You're welcome. Thank you very much for your attention, and I'm happy to, <laughs> to take some questions here.